Hello, this is Mike at Game from Scratch, and welcome to the next episode in the ongoing closer look at Game Engine series. This in series is entirely about trying to give you an idea if a game engine is right for you. It's a combination of um, review, overview, and getting started tutorial, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll have a good idea if a particular game engine is a good choice for you. And today, what we're going to be looking at is the S2 engine. Now, I'm going to get the negatives out of the way right away because this is going to be a deal breaker for some of you. Uh, first off, it is Windows only. The tools only run on Windows, and it only targets Windows. So if you're looking at creating a game that isn't for Windows, this isn't the engine for you. Hopefully this changes in the future, but I've never seen anything from the uh, developers to indicate that they have any intention of supporting any other platforms. So that's definitely a negative there for many people. On top of that, it is also 3D only. This is not a 2D engine by any definition of the word. There's no tooling in there for making 2D games. It would all be your responsibility. It's a poor fit. So if you're looking for a 2D game engine, again, the S2, ironic name there, engine is not a good fit for you. And finally, this is commercial software. It's not expensive software, but there is a price tag attached. Uh, and we'll get to that in one second. Now let's jump right in. Now first off, there is a text-based version of this review available on Game From Scratch. Uh, I published it about the exact same time and I will link it down below. So if you want you know, more details or you want a reference of some form, uh, it will be linked down below. I will also link the entire Closer Look At series. I've looked at about 20, 25 different game engines. So if you are struggling to try and figure out what game engine is a good fit for you, hopefully the Closer Look series is ideal. There's also a playlist here on YouTube. I will link that as well. All right, so without further ado, let's jump right right in. Uh, the S2 engine is available at s2powered.com. Um, it's also being sold on Steam. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on Steam, it is available for about 20 bucks. So it's commercial software. There is a price tag. Unfortunately, their trial system is an older, crappier, less you know feature prone version. I think this is a really big mistake on the developer's behalf. They should instead switch it to be uh, either time limited or save limited, some kind of thing. So it actually gives you, you know, a good developer experience, not, you know, based on an old workflow, which that's a really dumb idea on the developer's behalf. And that, you know, 20 bucks isn't an outrageous amount of money, but it is enough that people aren't going to throw that away, um, you know, if they don't have some experience with the engine. So I do recommend that they do release some kind of a demo so you can have an idea of what this engine's like. But hopefully this video fills in for you. And by the end of it, you do have a good idea if this is a worthwhile spend for you or, or not. Now, on top of that, there's also DLC pack available. Um, there's a Medieval Town pack available right now, which basically just gives you um, more assets that you can work with directly with the S2 engine. So if you're working with you know, a Medieval game, it's a bunch of assets that are ready to go already, and you basically just use them in your game as it goes. There's another DLC pack coming very, very soon. Uh, so you know, having pre-generated content to work with is often a very nice thing. So that's where actually probably the majority of their money is to be made going forward is in these asset packs and that's not really that uncommon actually if it gets to the point where these asset packs are successful enough it'd be cool to see if the actual base engine could go you know free or near free and they could support it entirely off the asset packs but you know i'm talking out my ass this isn't something that the developers ever said they were going to do uh, so let's jump on back to the engine actually i haven't got it loaded the engine is a Steam app launched from Steam like normal. So if you've ever used Steam, you've got a good idea what to expect. Uh, default screen brings you up to uh, various different video tutorials you can jump into. Now, one of the things I did find is some of these tutorials are not English language, uh, which you know what, I can understand having non-English language tutorials. The developer themselves are definitely English as a second language, and it shows at time in the documentation as we'll see shortly. But they should be careful about what they link. And the professionalism of some of these tutorials is a little, the production values are not stellar, unfortunately. But again, small team, it does show. The documentation on the whole is pretty solid. We'll see that in a moment. So here is your default view. The S2 Engine HD Editor is where all of the work happens. And I'm going to be doing everything uh, with the sample project that actually ships with it. Uh, it's a simple first-person shooter. Now, one of the things i got to say with the S2 Engine is I've seen some very uh, disparate uh, performance of results out of it. Uh, when I first started using it, I was getting a good uh, 50 to 100 frames per second. Very usable, very solid. And you'll see in a second, it's a very pretty engine. Uh, so these results were quite you know, livable. And then for some reason, it dropped down to like 10 or 15 frames per second. It was slowing my computer to a crawl. I don't know what was up. And then it kind of got better a bit and now I'm seeing kind of middling level performance uh, while I'm recording so the machine performance on this guy can be a little questionable uh, but here is the default editor uh, where you do everything and your scene view is where it all basically starts and you can see there's a, a pretty complete uh, pretty rendering of our world uh, right click to do mouse navigation so you can pan around the world like so 
uh, holding down the road mouse button, and then you can use the WASD key, the um, WASD keys to navigate around the world. Now what you're seeing here is various different markers in the world. Um, so you can click on things in the world and select them. We'll go through the various panels in a second. And you can see all the different scene objects over here that are currently active in the scene. So character one, and if I pick something and select it, I can go and click this guy, and we'll immediately go and focus on that particular item. So uh, there's a text object of some, no, there is no text object. Rigid body, all right, let's go look at that. And then pop, there it is. And we're actually underwater at this point, uh, but your scene is pretty cleanly navigated. Now at the same time, we can also go over here and bring up uh, tools, hierarchy, and this is basically your scene graph. So you can see all the various different things in the world. So let's say the weapons group here or gun. And as I'm selecting things from the scene graph over here, you'll see and there are also corresponding selection going on over here. And then select it. It should zoom in and point at it. I don't know why we're underwater. Hmm, not sure what I did there. All right, zoom in on this barrel instead. And then boom, we're back to the barrel. So that's how you can navigate around the world. Uh, your scene objects are over here. Your project view is essentially, um, the project view is where all the various assets that go together to make your game are. Um, so by default, you're in the objects view, which is all of the things in the game. Uh, go down here, you, can, you know, filter down. So this one is gonna show, um, I think that was models. Uh, here we got materials, textures, um, animation, sound files, etc. And this is just a filter, uh, filters down to the various different, so if I say, uh, fonts, it's only going to show me font objects. So if I go into the font folder, you see there is a font showing up. And then you can right click just about anything, bring up an inspector, and it'll bring up the appropriate uh, editor window or whatever is appropriate to it if there is something. Uh, same way if I go back to scripts. Uh, so let's say browse scripts, go back to the root. So here is our main or my entry point script. And then we'll do an inspect, and there you see a small little script editor. And you can configure this to bring up in whatever editor you choose. So you can have it open in Notepad, in Visual Studio Code, whatever. And we'll get back to the scripting language in a few minutes. So essentially, the project view over here is just a list of all of the different assets available for you, and you can filter what you're looking at off to the side over here. Now, between, uh, right now we're looking at small icon view. There's also a big icon view and a list view, and you've got basic search abilities built in here. So if we were working with a zombie, so zom, and that's a pretty useless search result. All right, uh, so that is your project view. On top of that, we have class view. Actually, over here, we got tools. So here are the various different pieces. So we just saw the hierarchy view here. All this stuff goes together. So objects view, which is this guy, brings up this view as well and your selection over here. So your, your different tools and panels are controlled this way. And at the same time, you can X close just about anything and it will collapse and go away. So class view all particularly gone. So if I come back here and go objects again, we get our object view back. So I can come back over here and go to project view and we all get our project view back. Now we can also minimize over and maximize back using such icon. And at the same time, you've got pretty good control over um, the graphic rendering going on around us. So you can see this is pretty detailed. There's some pretty nice stuff going on in the background, but I can come up to here, edit, and go to configuration. We can turn a number of things off and on. For example, we can uh, turn HDR bloom on, lens effects on, subsurface, uh, I forget the exact, subsurface, hey, oh God, an ambient occlusion, turn God rays on or off, color correction, motion blur. So you see all the different rendering features we've got. I don't even know what RLL stands for, so let's just basically turn everything on. Like so, and now you'll see we've got a uh, much prettier engine. We've got God rays coming in, etc. So there is really good graphic fidelity in this guy. Now at any, time, any point in time that you actually wanna go ahead and preview your game or your level, just go on up to game and click start. Little bit of a loading process and then Your game is started. So here you can see your character, default view, walk around using the control keys, shift to run, and then eventually there'll be some zombies we can shoot at, like so. And then escape to exit out of your game. So that's how your, your game preview goes. Now when you're actually done and finished and ready to publish your game, well, this is one of those advantages of being Windows only. This makes it very clean. We just can basically come up here, go, oh, sorry, uh, file, publish, 
Uh, basically, you pick where you want to publish your game to, what you want to call it, right here, and your starting scene, your starting script. Uh, if you want your logo, your texture logo on the way in, and then click publish, and that will go ahead and create an EXE for you uh, that's you know ready for distribution. So the publishing process is very, very, very easy. All right, so now let's head on back over to those tools we were talking about earlier. Now you'll notice everything down in this menu also has a corresponding uh, icon here in this hotbar. So same selections available there are available here. And let's highlight a couple of the key tools that are available to us. Uh, one of the things that you're going to like is there's a terrain engine built in. And we'll use this example that we're, oops, zoom up. There we go. So you'll notice right off the hop, there's this big circle radius being drawn on. Well, essentially, this is a height map editor. We can import our own height map if you wish. And you come on over here, it automatically brought up the terrain editing tools. Uh, I really wish they used a standard UI kit. Um, it's sometimes the user interface is a little clunky. Uh, sometimes it's a little ugly. A lot of times there's this, you know, more, and then there's actually nothing more available. It would have been nice to see them use something like a QT, uh, you know, just for a more consistent interface as opposed to their their own rolled system that they've done. But for the most part, it works pretty well. Anyways, back to the editor. So I'm going to drop the uh, radius down. You'll see we got selectable tools here for editing our train. So we can smooth out. We can uh, raise lower. Uh, we can step. We can ramp. Uh, we can paint the texture surfaces for the base texture map, etc. Uh, really good detailed level controls. We can do control our level of tiling as we're painting. Uh, we can paint roads down uh, using various different options here. Uh, or tracks, rivers, fences can all be drawn in. So if I get him, there's a fence being drawn, for example. So I can come up here. Anyways, so you can use this to draw uh, vegetation. So if I wanted to place trees in, I can go ahead and add trees in now. But let's go back to our basic elevation controls. I'm going to drop the radius down so it's not quite so big. And you can basically modify and raise your terrain. Let's bring the strength up so it's doing a lot more, like so. So if you've worked with any landscape engine, you've probably got a pretty good idea of what's going on. Uh, but that is pretty much the pause, um, the way it works. I come in here, let's drop our radius down for a bit, and we can smooth out our surface. We made it a little bit too sharp, edit it down that way. We get stepping, so if we wanted to basically create plateaus or flat layers. So, so then if I want to step that up a bit more, um, and we also have the ability to ramp, which I think transitions between two surfaces. Ooh, not sure what I did there, but there. So basically it's for creating elevations between two points. And that is your terrain editing. It's very, very you know, straightforward, capable. Um, and if you've used a, a landscaping solution, you've got a pretty good idea what you're going on working with here. And your various different um, you know, texture painting surfaces, etc., are all built in. So there's a nice amount of tooling built in here. You all should be probably surprised by the time we get to the end of it just how feature-packed this engine actually is. All right, so that is the landscape editing tool. Uh, you can also go ahead and create new landscapes by clicking this button over here, should you wish. Uh, next up, we've got uh, models. So you can say, for example, here, here's a model in the world of a barrel. Uh, you know, you got your viewer over here. Uh, you've got control over what you're being shown. For example, if you want to see the normals, uh, you can do so that way. You can see the UV map for said model. Show it that way, if you wish, or show none. For some reason, UVs are very slow. So you can toggle on the various different things. There's no joints in this guy. There's the vertices that are being controlled. And the kind of impressive thing is I can actually come over here and actually edit individual vertices if I really wish to. Um, but we've also got other tools here. So we've got, let's turn the joints on. Um, this is for physics properties, so bones or joints in this particular model. This one has none, so it's not really showing you too much. Uh, animations, again, this model has none. I'll get one in a second. And then your overall model properties. If it's got a hierarchy of bones or models in, um, within the model, uh, they'll show up here. Now let's actually go ahead and grab a different model, uh, something a little bit more advanced. So let's switch over here to uh, model view, go into zombie, and here is a zombie. All right, so there you go. Uh, same world navigation. Uh, properties that you've got from before. So now this model actually has some animations attached to it. I come over here and say pick the attack animation. Come down here you see we now have an animation timeline that shows the various keyframes across the uh, timeline of said animation. 
I can press play and there you will see the animation playing out. It's different animations available. And you've got the ability to uh, blend and mix uh, animation masks together to create uh, compound animations. So you can blend these different animations together to create, you know, transitional animations if you wish. Uh, so there's a pretty cool amount of tools packed in here for your model viewing. Uh, the actual process of bringing a model in is about as easy as it gets. Come on up here and go to import. Unfortunately, the only format supported for models is the FBX format, but almost every single game engine actually supports FBX to some degree. Uh, so here I'm going to just go ahead to my desktop, uh, users, me. Uh, desktop and here's a shipping container I created this exported it out from uh, uh, blender to FBX format this is actually available for the patreon site for game from scratch backers if you want to use this particular model and go ahead and uh, open it various different options we've got uh, it's going to create it in a folder called uh, shipping folder we could put it somewhere else but I'm just gonna basically dump everything into a folder called shipping container and you know there those are your you know, typical options while um, importing this particular model. It now came in. I go over to, should be now a folder called shipping container. There it is. I'm gonna click and inspect, and there you see. So it brings in textured models very, very simply. And as you can see, this was actually exported from Blender, so you can easily get Blender to work with your particular uh, setup. Now, what I do wanna do is come back to, let's go back to the zombie. Here you can see the various different animations available for it. Let's right click and inspect one of those animations. Uh, oh, how am I gonna get? All right, don't work with it that way. Let's go back to doing it via model. All right, so to models. All right, so there's our model, your tab up. So there's the various different animations attached to it. You've got control over the speed of the playback of said animation or the speed of the animation itself. So, well, idle is a bad choice, but there's neck bite, so we could speed that up if we wished. So there's two times speed, or we could really slow it down. Negative animation speed doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. You got control over the individual keyframes within this particular animation, etc. So you do have a lot of fine level control over your um, your models and your animations, which is kind of cool. Now, next up from our tools is all right. So that's models. Uh, fonts is pretty straightforward. Fonts is just um, yeah, let me go back to my oops root directory here. We're going to fonts. We will select the font type. And this is an FT2, this is an imported font type that actually uses the uh, BP font tool to create these fonts as F and T files, which are then imported. Uh, but you can see, you can set the size of it and then um, create one and have a preview of what particular font is going to look. Uh, nothing really special there, uh, but pretty comprehensive. We got a material editor. Uh, so let me just go back here and browse materials. Uh, this should be material under train. So here's a, yeah, here's a train material. Actually, let's get a better one than that. Say I've got now um, buildings. Yeah, so here's a brackish metal or thatched roof material. Uh, you can see preview over there. You can do cube or spherical view. Again, same tools to navigate it and look. You see the transparency is in effect. Nice clean rendering going on. Uh, we shut that down. We don't actually need the uh, animation doing. Let's go back to cube. So you can see it there. You can preview your menu over here. You can see the. Uh, various different maps that go up to make it. So this is a normal map. Uh, this is your diffuse map, They're working together basically to create this image. Uh, you've got control over the lighting of the material, the various different settings. Like so uh, we can modify the UV or the coordinates. Uh, we can tile it. Uh, so if we want to have, you know, uh, repeated tiling across it, we can modify those. Uh, we can change the layer coloring. Uh, layers can have multiple actual layers available, so you can have up to uh, four layers on a material. I don't actually know what this guy is for, I never found out, uh, but you've also got material properties you can set, such as you can have the emit light, like so, and you have, it's given a mission color, a mission map, uh, you can set its alpha scattering values, etc. So you've got a lot of control over your actual materials in here. Uh, we also have a texture viewer, uh, so let's go up here, tools, uh, textures, and it's basically just a preview of a given texture. So if I come up here and say, 
uh, there'll be a texture under building. So here's a brick texture. It's just really a color view that shows all. We can switch down to just uh, toggling off. So red, green, blue, alpha. So we can toggle what is actually visible and what is not. It's just a quick preview type uh, setting. Uh, what else is of interest? It sounds sort of the same thing. It's basically just a previewer for different sound files. Uh, where can I find a sound? Um, I think there's one under weapons. Yeah, so here's a machine gun sound. We can just, so you can see the uh, encoded rate that it's a mono 16-bit file, and we can preview it like so. Um, vegetation editor, way beyond what we want to deal with right now. Uh, there's a cutscene tool. This is actually pretty cool. Uh, so you can create cutscenes within your game engine. So let's go back. I believe if we go to scene view, cutscene, this will show. Let's go ahead and play our cutscene. So you see the weather is not so good. It's got text overlaid over time. So that's the title. You see if we select weather effects kicking in, different, different things happen. So basically this is exactly as the name suggests, a cutscene, keyframing, different things such as, you know, your camera's being controlled here, we're, we're translating and um, looking at a specific point using our camera. Uh, our scene, we're changing the daytime settings. And, uh, I'm not sure what that one's doing. And the title was the text we saw pop up. So this is for a way for your game to actually have you know, cutscene and, and interactions, etc. in it. Now let me just close that down. And the kicker is I'm not actually sure how to stop that playing once I've screwed it up. But while we're on that topic, let's get into effects. So that is your uh, cutscenes, but you've also got the ability to, um, over time, control a great deal of them. Okay, just a sec. All right, in my ignorance, I don't actually know how to tell a cutscene to stop playing, and I didn't want to have that thunder going constantly in the background. However, that thunder does lead us to the next section we're going to look at. It's the tools we've got, a very um, powerful capability here for um, controlling things like day night cycle, etc., And that's under the effects class. So we're going to go over here with special effects. And you see we got three categories of special effects. We've got uh, post-processing category, uh, the post-processing category, environmental category, and weather effects. And this is cool stuff. So for example, let me just go back in. Oops, I loaded the wrong scene. Ah, this will work anyways. So this scene is basically just this little island in the middle of the water. So now let's, for example, go back here, environmental effects, look at our sky like so and this can modify the various different properties of our actual sky and change up and change our fog add fog color we can you know, cancel out i don't really need a purple fog uh, what else can we control here change our clouds up cloud density, uh, we've got control over our sun, we can change the strength of the sun, like so you can see the immediate effect on the water, uh, you can change the moon, etc. We can make it storm, so if we want to add some rain, we just drag the rain multiplier over here. Uh, I wish I had made everything purple, where did I make things purple? Um, A few of these settings I haven't got a clue what they actually do, so I was just kind of playing with it. But I should not have made things purple, it makes things look pretty awful. Uh, so we got control over the storm that you hear in the background. So we turned on rain, we have thunder coming in if we wish. Puddles. So if I zoom in, look at the water, you should see the effect of the rain coming in. Uh, we can change the wind, the direction of the wind. So now if I go ahead and start our game, sunny day. All right, I did something wrong there. I'll cancel out. Anyways, so you've got control over the sun, the sky, sea, uh, HDR effects, if you wish. We can go on back over here to the post-processing. Uh, we can do a lot of different things. We can do like lens effects, if we wish. Uh, Uh, do motion blur, which I actually believe I turned off. Actually, I think I have all this turned. That's why we've got different issues going on. Oh, no, they're turned on. All right, never mind. Uh, so you see you've got basically control across the board. You can control the gamma levels. Uh, going back over here to uh, 
see that's post and then environmental so we've done environmental there's your post so your lens effects your tone mapping your shadows etc and then we've got your weather effects what's the difference between weather and environment So we can change the, the height of our water in our world. And change the tiling of the water. Bump. And change the overall color. Normal mapping. So you've got a lot of control over the individual graphic effects that go together to create your world. And it's very easy. Um, you know, as you see, it's basically just setting a bunch of settings and controllers and sliders. Now, to get into the specifics of them is way beyond what I want to cover here. But you can see you do have a lot of control over the graphic fidelity of your world, and your interaction is pretty quick. And we're getting towards the end of the tools that are built in. The last thing, and probably something I should have covered very early on, is actually the classes view. Bring up class, and this is how you actually go ahead and create things in your world or your, or entities within you know your planet. So, for example, if I want to go ahead and just create a um, cube object, you know, for debugging purposes or whatever, I'm going to go create cube object, and you can see the various different parameters of it are available down here. Now we can just create one in the world right there. 100, 100, 100. This interface is not as intuitive as you want, so you finish, you're done that way. My cube object should now be in the world, but I don't know why it's not. Cube. There you go. I think I just created a bunch of cubes underwater accidentally. Um, you can see several cube objects I've now created. I'll go ahead and select. Hey. Now here is one of the downsides of the S2 engine. I have experienced, unfortunately, um, my share of crashes and we just experienced one there. So I will pause and restart the engine. But this is definitely one of the negatives. I have seen um, probably a dozen crashes in the week or so I've been checking it out, which is definitely. Okay, so we're back in the engine. Let me go ahead and show you this process again. So this is actually how you instance various objects into the world. So if we want to create a camera or a cube, we come in here, we go click create, we pick the entity we want to create, and then you click in the world where you want to create it, like so. Now you'll notice down here, here are the various different properties of this selected item. So you see our cube object down here that we just created. Um, again, click this guy to snap and look at it. Uh, so we can do things like, you know, set the, um, the color of the object. So uh, it seems to have a texture attached to it. Um, we can attach a finite state machine to it, which is going to be important in a second. Uh, at the same time, we can also attach a script to it. And this is how things are actually controlled. We can set its position. And I don't know where that actually ended up going. Probably under the earth. But. You can do all your positioning this way. Now I don't have that selected anymore. Come on back here. Should be able to select it over here. And or you know what? I actually find this view easier to use. Hierarchy. Cube object. So back to class view. We'll set that back to zero. And it should be visible again, wherever the heck it is. So that is how you actually control various different properties. And this params class is going to be consistently used. So for example, I select something from our scene, such as uh, you know, a rigid body. You'll see over here, its settings are available over here. And the last thing you might be wondering is, okay, well, how exactly do I code in this engine? I suppose this is one of those things I should have gotten to earlier, but I didn't. And it's a bit of a mixed bag. There are two ways of coding in the S2 engine. The first way is using their um, S2 engine script. And I hate when game engines do this. Far too many do it. I don't like that Godot does it, even though while well, they're rectifying it. And I don't really like that S2 has done it. And they've created their own scripting language. It's a C-esque language. Um, go ahead and bring up an instance of it. So I'll go back to project. Uh, there are vehicles. There's, yeah, so let's bring up scripts. Vehicles. 
and we'll open that one up in Finder. There's no built-in editor, all you saw is, so if I inspect the script, the script will just show up over here in this window. You can't even really edit it, so you need your own editor to make this work. So open that up in Finder right here. We'll just open that up with Visual Studio Code. Now, their scripting language is based off of C. Um, give Visual Studio Code a second to kick in. So what I normally do is just basically tell it to treat it like C, and your markup's pretty solid. Uh, but there's no uh, code debugger or anything like that built in, so you're kind of on your own. Proprietary language, I don't like things that do this. Uh, but you see there's basically callbacks it's handling. So initialize, post initialize, update, which is basically your frame loop. So every every pass through the game loop, uh, you go ahead and, you know, this is the code that will run. And then the other key part is messages. And the message function is called uh, when it's received a message. Uh, so you say here, so if it received a message of type take control, then respond to it. If received a message of type left control, then respond to it. And that's essentially how you code using their scripting language. Um, there's a set of callback functions that are called across the life cycle of that particular script, such as, again, as I saw, uh, init, post init, and then update. Those are called at various different timelines um, automatically for your code. Your code updates accordingly. The, the language itself, if we head on over to the reference materials for it. Right here is your script reference. It's fairly straightforward. This is the API. The API is, you know, AI function, AI, create character, create object, enable hearing, uh, get nearest heard object. So, you know, the scripting language is pretty straightforward. It is defined for you. Hopefully it does what you need it to because otherwise you're kind of on your own. There is some extensibility support in C++ to create, create new modules for the editor. Uh, unfortunately, the documentation was purely a stub, so I don't actually know the specifics of what you can get into. Now, if we go back to later here for scripting, the overview, here is a description of the actual language. And here's one of those things you should know about the documentation as well. It's a little Englishy at times, such as here, syntax. And first off, uh, you know, I'm forgiving of this. Generally, you understand exactly what they're saying, but it is littered with kind of um, grammatic mistakes, typos, English as a second language type stuff. And there is a level of polish that's missing that, you know, a strict pass through a spell checker would have caught a lot of it. Uh, but the language is pretty simple. Uh, it is built around the idea of, you know, passing code. If you've worked with JavaScript or C, you've got a pretty good idea of, um, you know, what you're working with. The instructions here are solid. Uh, you will learn the language fast enough. Now, if the idea of, oh, and here are those callbacks I was talking about. There's init, post init, update, post update, message, and destroy. And then message is a way of sending or dispatching messages between um, objects or entities or widgets within your game world. So that's basically the way of communicating between objects while decoupling them so that one object doesn't have to be aware of the other. And then there are code. There is code available for actually, you know, handling so it's said messages. So you see here, send messages. You can single cast, multicast, broadcast, uh, GUI messages, HUD messages, AI messages, sub widget, and parent widget messaging. So it's the way you, you know, you communicate who your messages are being sent to. So anyone can basically send you a message. You respond to specific messages and deal with them that way. And that's kind of how the code is organized. It's a pretty standard way of doing things lately. Um, so if you've worked with any other game engine, you're probably pretty used to it. So here you can see, for example, receiving the message for hit. So if message received hit, oops, if you receive the message with the name of hit, you were hit, do something with it. There are ways of um, encoding and passing data uh, along with the particular messages. Um, you can expose messages back out. Like I said earlier, you can broadcast messages and messages can then be integrated uh, within the actual editor itself. So here you see in the class view, the various different messages available. Uh, and that's a way of actually testing uh, your code using, you know, you can send messages right in the editor and see how your entities will respond to receiving a given message. All right. Uh, so that's the one method of programming. The other one is finite state machines. And this is getting increasingly common. Uh, so let's go on down and show you. <coughs> so here is the finite state machine controlling. So I believe if I go into that zombie, no, there isn't one. All right. Uh, what options do I have? Go into characters. Is there? Yeah. So here we're in the character, uh, third person player script. And we'll open that up. And we'll bring up the event editor. And here you can see basically how it works. Now, remember when we looked at an object earlier on, here we have the option of 
FSM. So you can connect a finite state machine to a particular game object, and that state machine will then control the said game object. And the game objects will respond to various different events. So for example, init. And when it's finished, it will fire it off. And you see these connectors coming out. These connect to um, other events. So here you got, you know, choose weapon. And you can see, so just pan over. So choose weapon event is fired. Um, it goes down and they can either choose a gun, choose none, choose mace, choose knife. And that will then pass over to the stand command. Stand has an aim uh, event, which fires off to the aim um, uh, what was the terminology here? State. And then it's got outputs of type shoot, controls, and goes on accordingly. So let's just bring up aim for a second. So here is aim, uh, FSM settings. So we're in the editor. So here we are for the state of aim. So you see here, aim. And then the actions that aim does are controlled this way. So in this event, so we're going to do a get input action of type aim. So you see here, you can pull down the various different uh, input actions that are available, uh, which coincidentally you can define. Uh, let's go, is it here? No, it's various different input actions can be defined this way. Uh, so there is the aim um, action, and that aim action has been applied, uh, has been um, defined as mouse button one or uh, pad left shoulder various key modifiers, etc. So in the event of the left mouse button, which fires off this input action. Um, so if it is true, uh, we get set orientation from camera, uh, get object basis of aim direction, uh, get Euler angular from vector, rotate the node, send the event of event of aim is fired off, targeted at the camera or targets of the camera, um, and then get input action and we set um, shoot as the event is true. And that's sort of how this one fires off. So then the shoot event is fired. We come up here, we select it. So you can see the various different pieces that go into that particular, um, you know, finishes the animation of shoot end. Um, and it has no output. So that'd be the end of the actual event. So here are the various different events that are defined. Like so you can define your own. You can easily create and add one up here. You have variables um, that you can define this way. You can see the different types. Uh, so for example, um, movement forward is a floating point value, motion direction is a vector three. We can go ahead and create our own new property called, uh, for example, yeah, my, my var, go ahead and add that. So now we find, all right, where did you go? My var is now added. We can change its type. So here are your built-in types. Uh, we'll make that a vector three, for example. And then over here, we can in our state. So we could have added another one if we wished. And you know, we say assign or add vector three. Uh, output of type. Anyway, output. Let me add that in. So add vector three. Output is my var, and then we could define our two different vectors that we came in, or we could actually hook them up to existing. So camera position and those two. So it's going to add those two together and output it in the value of my var. So this is kind of a visual non-scripting kind of uh, approach to it, more of a UI based. Uh, your top down sequence of actions that are happening on the particular state, your transition between the uh, different states as shown by these wires is kind of similar to, uh, but much simpler than uh, say Unreal Engine's blueprint model or uh, CryEngine's flow something. I forget they're actually game flow or flow graph i think it's flow graph or uh, i believe even um godot is getting a system like this it, it's kind of the new norm it's a way of giving designers the ability to program without having to write any actual code now as a programmer i actually prefer coding i find uh, this workflow somewhat non-intuitive but as a non-programmer i can definitely see the value in this particular approach and um yeah i think that's about the extent of it you know, I'm only scratching over the surface of how, you know, this particular engine works. But as you can see, there's multiple programming models. There's built-in tools in there for models and animation, textures, materials, uh, special effects, cutscenes. Oh, there's a UI system that's, um, 
it's a beta, it's pretty early, so I'm not gonna really bother getting into it much, but you can also create UIs with various different controls, such as panels, text boxes, uh, buttons, strings, etc., uh, which can then you know, integrate back into this actual um, system. And this can call out to your UI layer, uh, etc. So it's a full service package. It's definitely an interesting engine. Some of the stability problems are definitely there. Performance problems can be a little bit iffy. Uh, it can be a bit of a pig. You do not want to run this one on battery power. And as you saw, we did experience a crash. So it's not always the most stable uh, engine, but it's not too bad for the most part. And uh, when it crashes, I always got a feeling it's about to do that. There's just this you know, sense that you're causing the crash, if that makes any sense. Um, so that's basically the tools. We're going to move on from that very quickly. Uh, so we'll cancel that out. And we're going to talk a little bit about the community. Now, first off, there's the tutorials here. And I mentioned earlier, some of the tutorials linked at the startup application, unfortunately, are not English. And as we saw some reference to some of the reference material, it is a little Englishy. Uh, so there are some syntax and some grammatical issues. Sometimes you're going to uh, definitely notice that the English isn't exactly what you meant it to be, but it is pretty comprehensive in what they've got going. You're going to run into some placeholders such as this one. A set of examples of how to create new classes, interface them with the engine framework. It's awesome. So this is how you create the plugins, etc except for the link doesn't go anywhere. So there are some placeholder documents, unfortunately, uh, ditto for cutscenes, but for the most part, all of this stuff is in here in documents. So if you wanna learn about using the terrain system, uh, we can click here. And we have various sets of videos available of varying quality. Uh, on top of that, we already saw earlier on, all the documentation is online, so you can jump in and take a look at it. It's under the uh, docs subcategory. You just link off the main page, you'll see a documentation link. But we got a solid set of um, you know instructions on getting you started, how to go through it, walks through the different editor section. Uh, if I go back to their website, so there's also a. All right, so we go here's your documentation link. There's the manual that we're looking at here. There is the tutorials, which we just showed a second ago, and then there is a wiki available as you can see here. Uh, next up, we have the uh, community. Um, the community isn't huge. They've got, it's split across a number of different areas. There's a Stack Overflow answer type site that is pretty much abandoned. Um, the Facebook page, official channel, uh, but the majority of where you're going to actually go is their forums or their Trello bug tracking board. Uh, the Trello board is fairly active. Uh, shows you what they are working on. And this is one of those things I actually talk about. One of the cool things about it is if you go to their forums, their developers are very active on the forums and very responsive. So if you report a bug, generally it is fixed almost instantly. They're very responsive to their community. So that's a very big plus there. And then finally, you do have the forums. And the forums, the communities aren't huge. Um, there's not a huge number of posts across them, uh, but I do find something that is posted is generally answered. If you search, you do generally find what you are looking for. It's not the biggest community by any definition of the word, but there is a community, the developers are active in it. And if you have a problem, generally you will find a solution. For example, let's just look at one question at random. Um, Oh, basically, this is him saying, okay, I could add that feature. Uh, radar, let's see if they answered here. How do I do it? Go ahead, here is I'm gonna go ahead and write a tutorial. Let's see if he goes back and actually does it. Uh, so you'll see if you do go on the forums that the actual developers are very responsive. Um, everything gets answered. Uh, generally, things are addressed. New features are added by suggestion. Uh, so that part is definitely good. The debugs, the, the Trello is very active. So if you do run into an issue, you can report it there and the developers are quite responsive there. And that is essentially the S2 engine in a nutshell. Um, kind of hard to summarize. It's a very um, full featured engine. Uh, its biggest problem is probably the fact that it's competing with the people that it's competing with. Now, first off, if you need to have anything other than Windows, it's not the engine for you, for sure. If you need to have 2D, it's not the engine for you, for sure. But if you're looking to create a 3D game on the Windows platform, um, well, you saw what it's capable of. It's a pretty engine, it's accessible. Um, the 
the features are there. You know, it, it's going to be a smaller community. This is not Unreal Engine. This is not um, Unity by any definition of the word. And mind you, it's also many times cheaper potentially than either of those. Uh, but it also has to compete against the likes of the Godot Engine or um, the Atomic Game Engine or Torque 3D and all those others. And is it worth it? Well, I'm never going to answer a value proposition, especially when you're looking at $20, because the value of $20 is very subjective to the person involved. But they have a lot of people to compete with, and they do have those limitations of, you know, very limited platform, only on Windows, only for Windows. So that's going to determine it for a lot of people. It's definitely a full-featured and powerful and capable engine. It's got issues, it's got glitches, it's got bugs for sure. Um, it actually did impress me by the amount of features that are actually there. The documentation, you know, once you get over some of the lack of polish or the English translation is actually quite good. Um, you know, most of the time I went to look for something in reference, I did find what I was looking for. There are some missing areas. I would like to see more of a, uh, here's a ground level, like here's what our game lo looks like. Here's how you create a game from the very beginning in text form. And that seems to be a little missing. And that's, you know, probably the area I struggled with the most when I went through it. Uh, but for the most part, the documentation will get you up and going. Uh, the content packs is definitely an interesting idea. And the lack of a trial is definitely a mistake. They should not be using an old version. So if you are the developer and you are listening to me, I highly recommend you create some form of, um, you know, uh, time limited or save limited features so people can actually try this engine see how it works on their machine see if the workflow fits for them because that's ultimately what's going to come down to it if you know people can work within the platform limitations that this engine has you know if they are making windows only games will it work for them does the workflow work for them and that's what they're going to have to decide and if they can't get their hands on it they're not going to make that decision so that's my number one piece of advice to the developer is you know get this out there in more hands and do it by making a more accessible demo not an older more crippled gimped version of your product from the past all right, so that was it. That was the S2 engine. Uh, I hope you found that interesting and useful. Please do click like, and if you're interested in you know game development in general, this channel's full of all kinds of stuff, tutorials, reviews, um, news, you name it, we cover it. Uh, so if that's your interest, please do click the subscribe button. Hope you did find that useful, and I will see you all later. Goodbye.